We're, we're in this series of messages going uh, towards Easter, this Lenten season of uh, uh, individual encounters with Jesus. And we're looking at that and seeing uh, what that means in our own lives as, as we encounter uh, the living Lord Jesus on a daily basis. And, uh, well, he's got like a, it is an angel thing, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> the waters are stir disturbed. <laughs> so, um, I got a, uh, I, with the Macbeth show was going on this weekend, the last weekend on um, Friday night I was here, and they had cookies, you know, which are nice, but they had fortune cookies, which I love, because I really want to know the future. <laughs> and, uh, so I got my fortune cookie, and I enjoyed it, and then I looked at the um, fortune. You ever done that? <laughs> this was, I'm going to get this right. Hope for the best. <laughs> Plan for the worst. <laughs> I'm going, how did they know it was me that was going to take that cookie? Wow. Hope for the best and plan for the worst. And I thought, you know, a lot of times what we do is we plan for the best. We plan for what we hope for, right? We, we plan, oh, I've got these hopes and dreams, and, and, and so I'm going to really... And then when the worst comes, we don't know what to do with that. Well, where is God now? What happened and everything? And, uh, and so that's why I spent a lot of my time really focused on the negative. You know? <laughs> So if anything good happens, I can go, hey, there must be a God, because it's not anything I planned. Well, we're going to look at this um, passage in John chapter 5, and uh, I think this is one of the most uh, fascinating encounters that Jesus has with, with somebody, um, and I have heard this preached really wrongly <laughs> through my life. And I told that to Dave Schieser this morning, and he said, well, you've probably been one of the ones doing that. <laughs> Who knows? But, uh, so let me read this, and then uh, we're going to jump right in. Is that okay? John chapter 5. Uh, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for a feast of the Jews, and there in Jerusalem, near the Sheep Gate, a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda, and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades, here a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, the paralyzed, and one who had been there, uh, an invalid, for nearly 38 years. Wait, when Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he'd been in that condition for a long time, he asked him, do you want to get well? And the invalid replied, I have nobody to help me into the pool when the water's stirred, and when I'm trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. Trying to get there before the greedy people, you know, but push them out of the way. Then Jesus said to him, well, get up, pick up your mat, walk. And at once the man was cured, and he picked up his mat and walked. The day in which this took place was a Sabbath, and so the Jewish leaders said to the man who had been healed, It's the Sabbath. The law forbids you to carry your mat. <laughs> 38 years I've waited for this. <laughs> and he replied, The man who made me well said to me, Pick up my mat and walk. Not my fault. And they asked him, Who is this fellow who told you to pick it up and walk? And the man who was healed had no idea who it was. Jesus had slipped into the crowd that was there. Later, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, hey, look, you're well again. Stop sinning, or something worse may happen to you. The man went away and told the Jewish leaders that it was Jesus who made him well. The Lord, teach us, teach us from this, how we might encounter you, how we might experience your care for us, how you might break into our lives in a radical way. And, uh, Give us the courage not to miss you. Amen. Well, uh, I have heard a lot of sermons on this passage, and most of them revolve around how to shame and make people feel guilty for being sick. <laughs> um, do you want to be well? Now, and, and I think most, most pastors who do that, I, I ought to tell you, they probably think that Jesus asked this to everybody that he healed. You know how many times this question was asked by Jesus to the people he healed? Yeah, just this one time. You probably realized it wasn't getting the effect you wanted. But um, from then on, he started asking people, what do you want me to do for you? 
Isn't that interesting? This question changed from that point. What do you want me to do for you? But this one was, do you want to be well? Now, I've never met anyone who was struggling in their life physical, emotional, relational, marital, financial, career, any dis-ease in their life. I've never met a single person who, if I would have asked them, you want to be well, they wouldn't have said, sure. Right? Except this guy. Didn't say that. Who doesn't want to be well? Now, um, it's easy for me uh, to look at people and go, you know, as I analyze your situation, I can see that you're probably getting something out of your illness, you know, so blah, blah, blah. That's why I'm so effective as a loving counselor. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I had a weird experience this last fall, uh, the first Sunday of October. And uh, I had disease for the first time. And uh, cover your ears if you're sensitive, because I'm going to give you too much information right now. <laughs> TMI. Um, it was a Sunday, that weekend, first uh, Sunday of October, and I felt like my body wasn't working anymore. And I've been a pretty healthy person, I, you know, I'm pretty active and everything like that, and never had anything wrong. And, uh, sorry if you don't want to hear this, but I stopped peeing. I couldn't urinate that weekend. And uh, I thought, well, what's the problem with that? I just drank more. Which, you know, that doesn't actually help. <laughs> it actually just uh, builds up pressure on your internal organs, basically. <laughs> uh, it didn't do anything. And if somebody would have come to me and said, well, John, pastor, do you want to be well? Why don't you go pee? <laughs> Maybe I have an emotional problem. Maybe I'm codependent. Maybe I didn't get the training I needed, toilet training or something, you know, as a child. Maybe, you know, let's get real Freudian here. And, uh, and there's probably a lot of reasons. Maybe it's a spiritual issue for me, and I, I have problems because I like to keep control, so I'm retaining. <laughs> you know, you know, there, you can really analyze this for a long time if you're a psychiatrist, or if you're not, if you just read People magazine, you can still analyze it. And, uh, and you can on and on, and uh, it would not have helped me one bit. Even if every one of those psychological descriptions were true and accurate, it wouldn't have mattered. Because, as it turns out, I had a uh, uh, malignant tumor in my bladder. Now, I could still have emotional problems, right? I could still have, you know, ambiguous thinking, or I could, maybe I wasn't faithful as a Christian or I hadn't prayed that day or something. But I still had a malignant tumor in my bladder that had plugged it up. And they said that the more you tried to pee, the more you pressed the growth down in there, making it worse. So, do I want to be well? Yeah. Uh, did that change anything? No, it actually didn't. So, yeah, and in your lives, you can think of yourselves or people that you love who have gone through situations or are going through them right now, and you go, I hope he doesn't preach on, do you want to be well today? Because that's stupid. Um, so what does this passage mean? What is, what is, what is it that God wants us to hear in this? What does He want us to know? The, the, the historians tell us that this pool of Bethesda, the sheep gate pool, um, the tradition was that uh, all the sick people would come around all day long and randomly, periodically, uh, the belief was that an angel would disturb the water. It's kind of like uh, Old Faithful over in uh, the National Park. And uh, bubbles would come up and 
everybody would rush to the pool or they'd have their family there to put them into the water and if they got into the water, uh, they'd be the one that would be healed. And everybody would be cheering and celebrating for them and then they're waiting. It's 38 years this guy's been there. He's seen a lot. He's watched it happen. <clears throat> he probably came and hoped. I'm going to see the bones and I'm going to roll in there. I'm going to be the center of everything and I'm going to be healed and my life will be different. After 38 years, you'd think he was really expecting it to happen or had it just become where he lived. <clears throat> he just, that was his routine. You know, I think of people who, they, they, uh, they we, we come to Jesus usually because we have a need, right? Either we know it or the people around us know it. And, uh, and so we ask Christ to come into our life and have his way in us. And, and, uh, and we need Jesus, right? And we get involved in a church like this, a community, and we start serving, and we need and we meet other people who need Jesus. But then pretty soon, it's easy to, this is just what we do. Don't really feel like I need Jesus anymore, but I could use a donut. <laughs> you know? <clears throat> Not say anything about donuts, you know, <laughs> but um, something changes. And after a while, we're not really seeing that we have a real need for a Savior anymore. That's for others. <clears throat> There's this uh, phrase that uh, Alcoholics Anonymous use that really struck me. Terminal uniqueness. People have terminal uniqueness. Uh, what does that mean? It's, uh, you feel like you're different from everybody else. So, you know, a person comes in an A meeting, like the one we have on Friday nights here, a sicker than most is the name of it. And uh, if you're over 32, you don't belong. <laughs> but it's the, probably the largest AA meeting in the city. It's huge. And uh, so you go in there, and you look around and you go, I'm 34. I'm not like these people. I don't need to go to a meeting like this. These people have problems. They struggle. I don't know. I'm not like them at all. I'm not coming back. Or you come in and you say, oh man, I don't belong here. I got real problems. I'm not like these people. They worked it out. They, they're all doing good. I'm not coming back. That's terminal uniqueness. Does that happen in church? <clears throat> oh, boy, it happens in church. How many times do you walk into church and you go, no, these aren't my kind of folks. I think I'm out of here. I don't need this. <laughs> I, I remember when we first, we were, I was a few years ago, we were first in here, so, uh, in this uh, facility, and uh, two of my very best friends. We've been in a small group for a couple of years here, and I've known them for years. And they came to visit the church. I was so excited because they they were they were coming to the church. It's great, you know. And so um, so excited they came, and there were about twelve of us, I think, maybe <laughs> fifteen or something, sat around, and I preached a regular Westfall kind of message. And and, there, and uh, the next Tuesday, I got a phone call. Can we meet for coffee? And I went, sure. You know, they probably want to make a donation to the building fund. I don't know. <laughs> this is going to be great. So I, I meet the husband for coffee, and I, and I go, hey, it's great seeing you in church, you know, a surprise, you know, I'm really glad you're there. And uh, what do you think? <clears throat> well, we've talked a lot about it since Sunday. I'm buying the coffee. Uh, yeah, we, so we talked a lot about it. You know, we counted in, uh, in your sermon you used a word at least three times. You said dysfunctional. <laughs> and that was unsettling to us because we thought if you use words like that, then pretty soon people who have dysfunction are gonna come to the church. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, we, we really aren't like that and we don't wanna be around dysfunctional people. <laughs> so either you're going to have to change your message 
or we're going to have to find another place. <laughs> bye bye. Bye bye. <laughs> yeah, my message never gets changed. Sorry. Dysfunction, dysfunction, dysfunction. Okay, so. But uh, I was stunned. We don't want to be in a church where people have issues, where they're working on something, where they need Jesus in their marriage or in their parenting or in their finances or in their job or in their soul or in their whatever. If they need Jesus, we don't want to be with them. We want to be in a church where people don't need Jesus. I thought, wow, I could throw a rock and hit three churches right now. <laughs> we don't need Jesus. <laughs> they never came back. We never went back to the small group. Um, but that's terminal uniqueness. We're different. And it'll kill us. It'll kill us, because we're not like anybody else. We're too bad, we're too far gone, or we're too good, too far along. And I wonder if this man at the pool didn't have terminal uniqueness. Jesus asked him, you know, 38 years you've been here, do, do you want to be well? Or is this just your life? He doesn't say, yes, I'd like to be well. Care to help? What does he say? Everybody else has somebody who's going to pick them up and put them in the pool for them. And, and they, you know, so they get their heavy in there. If I try and get in, if I try and get over, then these other people come and they crowd in and they push me back and I can't get in. I'm not like the others. They have people in their life who care enough to put them in the pool. They have people who hold back people like me so they can get in. And they, they've all celebrated the, the victories. They've celebrated the joys. They've celebrated the healings. And, and I don't have anybody celebrating me. I'm different from everybody else. Isn't that terminal uniqueness? Everybody else has something I don't have. How can you ask me if I want to be well? Now, here's the thing about Jesus. He disappoints us. You need to know that. If you think Jesus is going to make you happy, I'm, I've got bad news for you. Of course, I always have bad news for you. But, but <laughs> he disappoints us in a lot of ways. And I think he disappointed this man really something. Because Jesus could have had an angel stir the water, held back all the people, commanded them to stay where they were, and then he could usher the man down into the water, and the guy could, could feel the bubbles on his body and, and feel the healing in his legs and, and come out of the water and everybody's cheering and, and uh, give God the glory and all those things. And wouldn't that be amazing? What's wrong with Jesus? He says, well, just get up, take your mat, get out of here. <laughs> what? <laughs> That's not what I've waited 38 years for. I'm thinking the guy's going, uh, get up and take my mat. No way, man. I have waited almost four decades for those bubbles. And by golly, I'm not moving until I get the bubbles. <laughs> Jesus goes, well, you're going to be really disappointed because I just say, okay, get up and take your mat, get going. Can you at least do it in a dramatic way, like the TV evangelist? <laughs> you know, something? Just get up and go? Nobody's even going to cheer. They won't even notice in the crowd. I'll just be gone. I think it took an incredible amount of courage for him to do. Okay, I'll do what you say. I'm going to forego 38 years of waiting for the healing I wanted, that I planned for, the hope that I planned for. I'm going to just walk away with my man. And it takes a lot of courage. And then he gets in trouble. You know, the Bible could have stopped. You know, Lord, if you're listening, the Bible could have stopped with him getting up and walking away. Wouldn't that have been a great little story? And once the man was cured, he picked up his mat and walked. Now let's go to chapter 6. But instead, he's now in trouble. 
Why are you doing this? You're breaking the laws. You're breaking our traditions. You're, you're an unfaithful person. And what did the guy do? He goes, it wasn't me. It was, it was that guy who told me to get up and do this. And that's who you ought to be going after. Oh, who was that? I don't know. Some guy. So if you ever think that you have to have, you know, the exact total full faith in Jesus Christ and have all your theology in order before God will intercept your life and do some work, you're wrong. This guy didn't even know who Jesus was. Didn't even know. I don't know. Who's that, that guy? Now he's in trouble. He hasn't been in trouble for 38 years. Nobody would bother him because he didn't do anything. Now all of a sudden he's obeying Jesus and he's in trouble. And his, his defense is the same one Adam used. Remember when, uh, when God said, uh, hey, you violated the one rule I gave you. Why did you do that? And, and what did Adam say? Well, it was that woman that you gave me. It wasn't me. Don't come after me, Lord. It was really your fault because you made that woman for me. And she, you know, so wasn't that what this guy did? It's not me. Don't come after me. It was that, that guy who told me to do this. So I look at this and I go, okay, we've all got our terminal uniqueness. Uh, far, probably far more than we know or we let on. There's th ways we approach things that we say, I'm different. Doesn't apply to me. You know, I don't fit here. I don't fit there. But I think Jesus wants to cut right through that defense mechanism that says, I'm not like the others. I don't need Jesus. I, I just, it's misfortune. I don't have the right people in my life. I just, you know, I've had some bad luck. He wants to break right through it and say, you want to be well? You want to be well? It was like he said to me, John, you want to be well whether you can pee or not? If you never pee again and you die of an exploding bladder, you want to be well? Well, I don't know. <laughs> that sounds painful. <laughs> but if we say yes, I want to be well, Lord. Whatever happens or doesn't happen. Either way. Now I think that Jesus wants to do something very specific and very uh, powerful and very transformative in each of our lives. If we would set aside our terminal uniqueness and let him. So here's what I want you to do this weekend. I want you to take out a piece of paper. You don't have to do it right now. You can if you want. Uh, write it on a check. <laughs> just can't get away from being a pastor you know <laughs> so, I want you to write this down where do you need Jesus to meet you this week where do you need him to meet you where do you want him to meet you or what do you want Jesus to do for you or how do you want Jesus to fix your life none of that where do you need Jesus to meet you this week it's going to be different for all of us It might be a glaring issue that you, you need a miracle in. You say, Lord, I need you to meet me there. It might be a troublesome thing in the shadows that hasn't taken shape yet. And you're going, you know, this could, this could be not good. Lord, I need you to meet me there in the shadows. I need you to meet me in my blind spots where I don't see. I need you to meet me in the things that I've carried with me for a long time. I need you to heal me. I need you to heal my marriage. I need you to heal my... Something's wrong at work. I don't know what it is. I need you to heal me there. Meet me there. And then I want you to look this week. Eyes open. No excuses. No terminal uniqueness, I want you to look and say, all right, let me see where Jesus needs to be here. Look for it. Say, Lord, I'm, I'm looking for it. 
Now, I don't know what Jesus is going to do when he meets you there. That's between you and the Lord. Okay. But I want you to ask. And I want you to have your eyes open to see. And I believe it'll probably be a different result than we were expecting. It may even be disappointing, like for this guy. Well, just get up and get out of here. That's all? Yeah. Quit it! Okay. Uh, or it may be something totally unexpected. But I believe he wants to meet us there if we would take down our defenses that block him out and hold him back. And I'm expecting uh, miracles in you. In me. In our, in our lives. As we claim. So pray with me. Lord Jesus, come into our lives again. We invite you into our hearts and our minds and our situations, frustrations and our struggles. We pray that you would be Lord of all and we would commit to hold nothing back from you. But we invite you to come in and have your way in us and through us. Give us the courage to, to see you in a new way. And uh, thank you that you interrupt us. You break into our world and uh, and you don't leave us unchanged. And for that, we're grateful. So stay very near in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.